Welcome to Fire Engineering's Hangout for today on Wednesday. We got a great show for you. We have some great guests. We're going to talk about technology and command. We'll cover some command failures. We'll PJ and I will ask some tough questions. And we got some great guests from Adashi, Scott, and we also got the chief of Stanford, Connecticut, who assisted in some R&D for this new collaboration between Scott and Adashi to enhance command and firefighter safety. Um, without further ado, I'm going to just introduce Sanjay. Sanjay is the director of Adashi. Um, he's also a Rockville volunteer, which I'm proud to announce I was made an honorary member at their last membership meeting. I was a student living in Rockville, and I put all my success and, of course, all my failures on that experience of uh, being a living in Rockville, but it was such a great experience. It was such an honor. And we got to see Chief Hine a lecture at FDIC this year. He had a packed room on a Friday talking about retention, the student living program and volunteers. So it's, uh, it's an honor to have you on the show, Sanjay. And if you'd like to introduce yourself and introduce our uh, two esteemed guests, and then we'll go to PJ. Certainly, Frank, thank you. Yes, uh, I'm a Rockville volunteer as well. I've been on for the last 10 years. Prior to that, I was uh, I also started Firehouse Software. That was, I was one of the founders and I've been with Kadashi for a long time. And this has been uh, this has been my baby. I really wanted to do this for the fire service. Being a firefighter, this makes a big difference. So uh, with me is uh, Kim. I'm gonna hand this off to Kim. Hi. Uh Great to be here. I'm Kim Henry. I'm the uh, senior new products leader for 3M Scott Safety. And believe it or not, I've been working with the uh, fire service for over 30 years. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about incident management for the fire service. Now I'll hand it over to Mike. Good afternoon. I am actually the assistant chief of career services for the city of Stanford Fire Department. Uh, we're a combination department. We have about 260 career and about 100 volunteers. And I am uh, very excited to be here and talk about this uh, new product that uh, Dashi is, uh, has put out. PJ? Hey, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome uh, to this month's uh, Hangout with Frank and I. Uh, coming off an exciting, uh, thrilling FDIC. Uh, look forward to, uh, you know, seeing you, everybody registering again for 2023. Uh, today's show is going to be great. As many of you know, I am a, a huge advocate for technology and integrating that technology into uh, both our training, uh, but also the fire ground. Um, and, but my concern always with technology, and I'm really interested to hear uh, Chair Chief Robles' input on this, is how to make sure that we're not losing sight of the actual fire ground tasks by paying too much attention to the technology. You know, I have a, uh, an opinion that many line of, some line of duty deaths that indicate you know, rest, rapid fire development. Well, yes, we have this rapid fire development, but I think it really comes down to that someone may have just missed the signs that this rapid fire development was occurring. So my fear with technology is always that it, man, it really enhances our ability to command and control incidents, but yet making sure that this doesn't take over the command and control and we miss what the fire ground is actually telling us. So I'm really excited to hear about the technology, but also to see how Stanford, who's an extremely progressive department here in Connecticut, is integrating this into their command and control. So uh, I'm going to sit back and monitor the chat. If anybody has uh, any questions or feedback, use the hashtag FE Talk on Twitter as well as Facebook, and I will uh, forward that to the group today. So thanks for joining us. Thanks, PJ. I'm going to introduce uh, Mark Vendetto, who is a retired chief of operations for the city of New Haven fire department, who's been instrumental in putting this group together. So chief, welcome to fire engineering's hangout. It's an honor to have you here. Do you want to introduce yourself? Cause I know you have a new role now. Thank you, Frank, for having us. Putting help with and he just froze. So we'll wait for him to unfreeze. Um, you just froze. So start over working with the different companies to actually come together and put this technology out there. And uh, I can even touch base on where I think it'll play in with uh, what PJ was saying uh, as far as the computer systems and not getting too uh, caught up in them. Great, Chief. You're freezing, so just check your internet connection. 
on that where we're waiting for that. One thing that I want to point out is I think that technology can really enhance command and firefighter safety. However, I got to be perfectly clear that when an incident commander is working with their hands, they're not working with their head. And I've seen all too often, especially in smaller departments where you have the tablets come on, you have all these fancy command boards and they're so focused on the technology and the command board, they're missing what's happening right in front of them. So while I am a firm believer that this technology could actually enhance firefighter safety, I think it's important that when we're going to put this technology on the fire ground, we want to have a scribe or somebody married at the hip with the incident commander or division officer who's actually the one writing on the command board or putting in the information in the tablet. That way that incident commander is still focused on what they're hearing on the radio, what they're seeing, and then they can convey that information and kind of work with the scribe that they're married with. Having a command aid, I think is critical, especially when we look at the NIOSH 5. It seems like it seems like we don't need another government program to tell us how firefighters get killed, right? It's always accountability, poor communications, and we want these marriage of these two companies with some new technology, we wanted to enhance firefighter safety, not hinder it. So I really recommend that if you're going to put this technology or any technology, even the old fashioned command board into practice, that we really have somebody standing married next to the incident commander. It does a couple things too. It also mentors that individual to understand the role of command so that later when they're in that position, they get kind of that bird's eye view but it also allows the technology technology to work at, I think, the most efficient level. And I'm going to go to Sanjay. Um, you can weigh in on that and then kind of explain this partnership, how it came about and what we're, what we're talking about today, because I plan on getting educated today. Certainly. I think uh, PJ mentioned that when he first spoke about this. Uh, it is very important for the incident commander to focus on the fire, whatever's happening in front of the person. One of the things that was a focus when we did the R&D and development was to make sure we notify the commander when things change. No point in the commander looking at a computer to make decisions. In our case, we wanted them to be notified when things go wrong. Uh, I didn't mention this, but a lot of the R&D was done at both Stanford and New Haven Fire. We spent a year plus working with them to make sure this was perfect. That's one of the things we noticed was we wanted to show them when things change, like let's say my air goes to like five minutes, uh, we wanted to notify the commanders. You got to make a decision now to either pull the person out or the company out or do something else, whatever the decision is. But we didn't want them to look at a, a screen to make decisions. So that, that was a real big focus when we were uh, kind of doing this. How, we, how this came about was we started this conversation at FDIC before the big shutdown. So Long and myself and Kimberly got together. We wanted to make a difference because typically incident command is paper-based, right? I mean, people use paper or whiteboards. We wanted to, we have an incident command solution that uh, it, it, think of it as a single pane of glass that gives you a lot of information, but accountability was separate, meaning that you're using a manual process or a passport, whatever the case may be. And Scott had this technology that had, you know, the telemetry data coming in. So it made a lot of sense to combine those two things together and notify the commander when things go wrong. If things are okay, meaning you know uh, nothing's wrong, nobody's getting hurt, et cetera, there's nothing to do. You just, the incident happens, you mitigate the incident and you move on. So we wanted to make a change where the commander knows they got to do something if the conditions change and we notify them when things change. So that was an important factor. So Sanjay, you're saying this new technology, and I could even go to Kim to answer this, is going to notify command the air level in somebody's bottle? Absolutely. So, yep. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Kim. Yeah, absolutely. And that was one of the things um, as part of uh, the feedback we received from our customers. We already had a system that provided that telemetry information, right? How much air is left in the bottle? Um, but you know, per the NIMS uh, guidelines, which is the National Incident Management System guidelines, it didn't provide all the critical information that uh, incident commanders need at, at the scene of an incident. So we spoke with Sanjay and said, hey, you know, this was a way to bring you know, the, the best of both worlds together for our customers, because uh, they really want one pane of glass to see all that to see the critical information they need um, at an incident. 
So Sanjay, is that all this technology does is gives the incident commander a screen into air levels or is there more to this for command and control? There, this is an incident command product first with accountability. So the goal is to let the commander run an incident on a single pane of glass, shows him different data points to make effective decisions. Accountability is built into it. We, want, we didn't want that to be separate. So as somebody turns the SCBA on, automatically we know who it is, you know, what, what company they're on. We can track their assignments, how long they've been in, in a certain assignment, and we log all this information. But when things go wrong is when this becomes very effective. For example, a fast alarm goes off, the world stops, the commander knows right away. When the alarm goes off inside the building, they know who it is and how long they've been in whatever assignment they were in and how much air they have all at the same time. So they can start making you know, quick decisions on what the next steps are right away. That's one, we have an electronic PAR system. PAR, as you know, is a long, it's a long process and it's radio-based, meaning I start at the top, work my way down through the companies. This one is completely automated. I touch a button, sends out the signals to the Scott air packs, the firefighters hit a button, we know who's, who's okay. The idea here is to show who's not okay quickly so they can you know, do whatever the next steps are. If it's a mayday, they know exactly who it is, what the last position is, and what the last assignment is very quickly so they can go you know, rescue the fire. That's, that's phenomenal. Chief Vendetto, now that we got you back, um, who's since retired from New Haven, you were strong proponent of getting the tablets into New Haven and putting them into action. Um, have you been, had the ability to work with this with the, with the low air thing and see how the low air and the accountability uh, all come together? Yes, I have. Um, we actually worked with New Haven and Stanford on the project when it was first coming together to see the low air alarms come in, um, speeding the process up. Now we got to remember that, you know, over 54% of Maydays, the first time they're called are missed. And this is by guys that are just using the radio or supposedly just using paper. 54% of the time, the first time the Mayday is called, it's missed. So hope, hopefully this is going to speed the process up and actually make it easier. And we all know that firefighters are late to call in the Mayday. So the fact that you're seeing that low air alarm is giving the incident commander and the safety officers that heads up. Chief Robel, what is your been? What's your experience? You were instrumental in the R and D of this. Um, is it a distraction? Is it easy to manage the screens? Kind of give us some of your insight on this. So you, you brought up some very good points before about you know having a person stare at a computer or the incident commander. Uh, then he's not going to focus on this task in front of him in, in regards to the fire. So I agree with you one hundred percent. And in our case, uh, we have the incident commander directing the fire. We have an aid that helps him in gathering this data. But one of the nice things about the product, the CNC product, is that you could split out that section of the air monitoring to someone else. Uh, we're currently having a, a new command vehicle built where we're going to have three monitors. The back monitor, we hope, is going to be for our incident commander. And there's going to be monitors on the side where a safety officer now could take over and watch the air and see how much air the firefighters have. Uh, you know, an incident commander could say, hey, you know, this guy is now running, he hasn't run out of air yet, but he's getting close. Let, it's time to, let's move him, assign a, get somebody else on that task. So that, that's where I really think this, this software is gonna shine. And I really do believe that it can save lives in the future. Well, that's, that's an unbelievable endorsement. Um, Chief Norwood, I wanna go to you and even with, if you're not managing your fire grounds properly now, no computer system is going to really save you. This has to be to build upon some concrete command principles. And one of the things that I think that we all face and we talk about is firefighters on a scene are often like herding cats. And firefighters need to be trained from the very beginning that you are either at the command post, in reserve, at rehab, or assigned. And that if you enter the building, the last place you should go when you come out, the first place you should go when you come out is, again, that command post to say that you're out. Can you weigh in on just, you know, firefighter accountability at the basic level and then how this could enhance it? 
I agree, Frank. But before I get to that, I do want to hit on one uh, touch on one point of what Chief Endetto was mentioning uh, regarding Maydays being missed the first time. And go back to a project uh, you and I were involved in, I'm going to say about seven or eight years ago, uh, wrote an article on uh, for our dispatchers and our telecommunicators. And we published through Fire Engineering and Penwell a training DVD for our dispatchers because we can't forget about the importance of training and educating our dispatchers to be prepared to handle that May Day when the incident commanders do miss those May Days. So, Chief, thanks for, for pointing that out and give a little reminder to so give a little plug to our, our some of our older projects there that are, are still relative today. Um, you know, and Frank, getting to your question as far as command and control, you know, the department that I come from, uh, you know, command is not necessarily how the books are written because we don't have or we didn't have those staffing positions. You know, the incident commander is the incident commander. He or she is operations. He or she could be the safety officer. You know, they're filling all of those roles because we don't have an aide. Uh, we don't have additional company officers. There's now one captain on the shift. So it's a shift of 13. One of those is a captain. One of those is a battalion chief. The battalion chief is running the operations where now the captain is, is taking that up, uh, that operations role. And sorry, the battalion chief is taking that IC role. So it would be very challenging for a department that is struggles with staffing uh, for products like this. While I agree, it can absolutely enhance the fire grounds when you have the right staffing. So I think when you're looking at products like this and looking at technology, so I'm an advocate, but we have to make sure that we have the proper people to run those. I, I applaud Stanford for not just now, but for the many years to making sure that they have the staffing in place to handle what they need to handle and now to be able to bring in technology. And I'm sure they go to instance and I'm sure they still don't have the staffing that they truly need to handle everything that they have. But we have to remember from a department's perspective, we can't get into that you know, one mindset for every department because all of our departments are different. And while the goal and the mission is always the same, Sometimes how we get there is going to be different. You know, when I was, you know, commanding fires in East Haven, I could be on the border of New Haven and Chief Vendetto can be commanding a, a two and a half or three wood on one side of the line and he's going to have 30 arrive. And, you know, then I get you, Frank, from the, the school and everything else. The very next house on the other side of the line, I'm going to get 12 at the max without our volunteers. And that's going to take us eight to 10 minutes to achieve that. So, you know, two very different departments that may be only be separated by 20 feet. So while the technology is great, I do think we have to make sure that we're matching the technology to what our abilities are and, and making sure that, again, we're now assigning the proper people for those command roles to making sure that we're not confusing incident command, the incident commander and operations and safety. And in my case, making sure that we're really working with our mutual aid partners and have an automatic aid um, to get enough staff there to one, take care of the incident, but also to manage the incident and incorporate the technology. Very well put. Kim, this technology, I think you mentioned that it cuts down on radio traffic because the firefighter can just acknowledge a par by a button. Can you explain a little bit how that works? Because I think we can all agree that the par takes away a lot of valuable radio space, especially when they're doing pars for people that aren't even near the hazard area at that time. Uh, go ahead, Kim. And actually, I will, I'll pass it off to Sanjay because that particular feature is uh, specific to Adashi's software. Certainly, I can take that. So Frank, you mentioned that it takes a long time to go through a par process, especially, you know, like uh, New Haven has a lot of, lot of companies coming into a fire. Uh, you know how Rockville operates. There's lots of companies. So yes, it's a long process to hit the buttons. In our case, PAR, you touch the PAR button, commander sends PAR signal to all the SCOT SCBAs, and each firefighter hits the button. So in our case, you know, if the typical PAR process says the, the company officer verifies his or her team's okay, and then they say, you know, I'm PAR with all the other details. In this case, each, each person hits a button. And in our software, we tell we automatically mark that company as green. So the companies that have not hit their PAR buttons, are they're not marked green. That tells me quickly, just by looking at one screen, which company has not hit the PAR. And then I can focus on them through either radio or whatever methods that you want to use to make sure that they're okay. So if they're really in trouble, you're going to get to them very quickly because I know that they have not hit the PAR button. 
if things are working fine, there's nothing a commander needs to do because they hit the bar, it goes through its process, it's complete. It's literally seconds now versus minutes that you would go through a bar process because the signal goes out to all the SCBAs at the same time. And it only goes to the SCBAs that are on. So your point about somebody like, let's say in staging, that does not have the SCBA on, there's no need to even hit the bar button because it only goes to the ones that, that are on. So we think it's going to make it very fast and also makes, you know, gives us the opportunity to find a person that's in trouble quick. Sanjay, how's that affect if, say, we're in overhaul stage, the measured for CO2, hydrogen cyanide, safety officer gives the all clear. Um, everybody still has a bottle on their back, but they're not breathing air. Is there a way for that part to still work? We just had a tragic uh, line of duty death, I believe. I don't like to really comment early before the investigation, but I believe the fire was out and they were actually uh, walking through with the fire investigator. So so there is a reason for, while we want the main focus in the hazard area, there is, when firefighters still have it on their back and it's not on, sometimes you still want to do a par of those those firefighters. Can you address that? Certainly. This, this technology only works if the STB is on. If it's off, the SCOT system is completely powered down and you cannot send the PAR signals to it. So you'll have to go through your current methods, probably radio if that's the case, but that part of the, the incident overall. Okay, Chief Robes, I want to I want to go to you because you explained, you know, you use this and we were talking about, you know, I think you were saying that the air component of it could be put to another firefighter or safety officer to manage. So as your command staff gets bigger, you can expand how this technology is going to work. One of the things that I'm concerned with is for that small department, and trust me, I'm a firm believer, there's no politician on scene that says you can't call for the help that you need to control your incident. Everybody wants to go to your fire. Your badge should say logistics if you're a chief. So there's no reason why you shouldn't be calling for help to build that out. But we do know that it takes time to build out that command structure, even in a city. So if you're the incident commander and you have these screens that where you, as individuals and command staff comes, where you could pass off a screen, the PAR screen, you could pass off the air screen. Do we need to be careful to make sure that we adjust our SOPs for the incident commander that those screens will be passed off as other command officers come on? Because what I'm worried about is you get a single incident commander and now all of a sudden something goes wrong within three minutes and you'll have a report, a NIOSH come in and say, well, wait a second, you weren't monitoring in the air and the accountability screen when you're trying to get your whole incident together. Can you kind of speak to that? Yeah, so the software, if you, let's say you don't have the manpower to monitor the actual SCBAs and see what the air uh, is left, um, the software will let you uh, uh, pass through the alarms. If somebody's in trouble, those alarms are going to come through in the incident command part of the software. So you will get the alerts, even though you're not monitoring the air, because maybe you are short staffed or you're there, you're there alone. You're the only incident commander uh, and, and you're focusing on what's in front of you. So the software will make some noise. It, it, so if somebody calls a mayday from their SCBA, it turns red. Uh, so there are things in the software that kind of fit a, a one-man show or you divide it. And that's the part we particularly like is that you can grow it and assign different tasks to different people and the software will handle that. That's that's absolutely phenomenal. And any department that, that represents that, that should be included in the, the SOG for it that you know, it is expandable and the incident commander is still going to get the alert for the, the pass alarm going off, but they're not necessarily may not be able to manage people's air. That's for the company officer to do. So just we're protected from that staffing, um, that staffing aspect of it. I'm going to go to Chief Vendetto to weigh in, but I also want uh, Chief Vendetto to weigh into another component because we experienced this on a hazmat when we were utilizing Adashi. And one of the things that the DEP loved, because it was a prolonged lab um, incident where it was an illegal lab in an actual science building, was that DEP loved the fact that everything was time stamped. So when they were looking at 
the radio reports and they were looking at when divisions were created and teams entered. It was all documented and allowed them to take that record afterwards to help in their case and helped us with the critique. So, Mark, if you, uh, Chief, if you could talk about time stamping and also weigh in on what the chief was saying. Sure. So I'd like to start off with the first part with the smaller departments. If we think about it, even though you're a small department, it doesn't relieve the IC of not performing accountability. So the option then for the smaller departments are you got to have a piece of paper and write something down. You got to drag a big whiteboard up the street, draw your org chart. So you still have to perform accountability. You will still have to listen for May days that are being called. You will still have to keep track of your members in the building. So the computer can actually help you. It's a smaller one thing. You're just signing, assigning companies to the groups or divisions or however your SOGs are written. So even for a small incident commander or a small department, you are not relieved as the incident commander not to perform accountability. So you still have to do it. So you're either forced to write it down on a piece of paper, draw it out on a whiteboard that you drag the box up the street, or use an or use the computer to help you. And then when you get further help, that's when you can expand it out and get other computers up and running. So I think the notion of smaller departments can't utilize this technology, just hasn't played with it yet or understands where it comes from. Because that's something you always hear is, oh, I, I don't have time to do that. Well, you're saying you don't have time to do accountability. The other part of that is, yes, it's a lot of PSAP departments could hear Maydays, but a lot of departments also work on simplex radios, which don't go back to the don't go back directly to dispatch on fire ground. So in that case, uh, the dispatch centers are not hearing what's going on at the fire ground. So so every department does operate slightly different in those cases. So that's something I want to bring up. Uh, yeah, uh, using hazmats, time stamping. So at that. We um, actually made entry. We were uh, we had all our time stamps. We were actually taking photos from inside the building, sending them back out to the command post, looking up the chemicals, looking up at the containers. So when Deep even got on scene, they realized when we were on scene, when we had certain readings at certain levels, uh, what was going on. Um, they really liked the fact of seeing the product without them making an entry. The fact that we were able to pull up all the cameo, uh, have Cloud Plume set up and actually share that information throughout the entire call. Uh, Deep was very happy with all that information. Uh, well said, Chief. And I agree with you. The incident commander is always going to be responsible for accountability. They are the safety officer unless a safety officer is assigned. What the comments that we get from smaller departments is, now that you have a, where you're actually monitoring the air, I'm not talking about the mayday or the pass alarm, but when they first get there in that initial thing, when they're there by themselves, they really, a lot of individual incident commanders isn't going to have time on their own to actually monitor the air before there's an emergency. So that's what well, I'm saying. Well you're, well, you're not monitoring the expand. I'm sorry, Frank, you're not monitoring the air. The program's doing that for you, right? So you set your levels. So you don't, you don't care for guys in the green. You're not watching a guy's air bottles. You're not sitting there as the incident commander watching a guy go from, 40,000 to 3,800, you're going to get alerted only when they're in the red or where your department wants to set the level. So if oh, you okay. know that the fiber alert is going off, that's when it activates. So for an incident commander, yeah, then you need to know you need to rotate your crews. So you're only being notified at critical times. So the notion that you're sitting there watching the air bottle go down, that's not how it works. It works in the background. And then if you, whatever you're setting for your parameters, so when the firefighter goes into a low air alarm, that's when it shows up on the screen. So you're not watching bottles. You're, you're that, not. That makes, a lot, that makes a lot. Of, that makes a lot of sense. That definitely um, gives me some reassurance. So I think that that's good. Uh, Chief Norwood, uh, weigh in on this. So I do have a, uh, another question. So we talked about sharing this information of everybody on that incident. For those smaller departments, could that information be shared back or? Uh, not necessarily shared, but viewed by the dispatch center. And could you enroll your dispatchers or somebody in your communication center to assist with monitoring that as well? Or is it uh, localized only to the incident? Oh, so I, I really like to take that one. So PJ, in, in New Haven, our PSAP center is set up with CNC in the program center. So they actually perform roles with the program. So they actually set our alerts for when the 
uh, chief officer's first radio report is due. So they'll turn around and um, an alarm will come up on the screen that the uh, your first radio report is due. They also set up alerts for secondary searches, primary searches. They actually get to see the actual org chart that you're forming in PSAP. So when we're talking about putting that radio, again, if departments are going simplex and not having to go back uh, to PSAP, this information actually goes back to PSAP. They'll see the low air alarms. They'll see the mayday alarms. They'll see the org charts. They can actually go and see maps and actually see where the companies are located on the scene. So it actually increases the ability for PSAP. In fact, you could be anywhere in the world and because it's on a server, anybody can interact with the program that would have access to it. Frank, if I can jump in and add to that. So one of the things about the Adashi CNC is the ability to share information with others. So if, you, if, uh, if I'm a small department with one commander, they can certainly see all the information on one single pane of glass. But if I'm a larger agency that I have like a safety officer assigned, or like, let's say I have another chief that shows up with CNC, they can see what is happening in real time. So if the commander makes a change or, you know, there's an alarm, all of them see it at the exact same time. So imagine uh, Chief Robles mentioned the new command car with, with multiple TVs. If I'm a root officer, if I'm close enough, I can watch the air bottles, only the reds. I can set a filter to say, show me anybody that's in red, because if it's green, I don't care. If it's in red, I can kind of monitor that company, what they're doing, what they're assigned to, and how long they've been there. In, in real time. And like uh, Chief Vendetto said, I can be in my, let's say I'm the chief, I'm in my office, I can monitor the fire ground in real time. So that's built in. Chief Robes, what has your experience been with this? Kind of give us the, the nuts and bolts from a fire ground commander's uh, perspective on this. You're muted. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, currently, most of our experience right now has been through the testing phase that we've done and uh, we were lucky to have a proby class and we really put this through the test with the probationary firefighters. Uh, we, like I said, we are waiting for this incident command car to come and to do a full deployment of the software. Um, so that's where we currently are. Kim, how do you, how has this been integrated across the country? Is this at the, just the end of the R&D stage or is other departments across the country using it? So we are currently towards the end of the R&D stage. You said it correctly. Um, and uh, Adashi has been pretty successful with um, showing it and implementing it with other um, departments across the country. What I, I would like to add is, one of the reasons why we did this collaboration is because we wanted to provide our customers with something simple and easy to use. I mean, that is a big thing with the fire service, especially in uh, when an incident is going on. They want something simple, not a whole bunch of, of, of information at one time, but only that critical information when you need it um, um, available to them and others. Um, within um, that's uh, managing the scene. So um, yes, it has been implemented and um, we are looking to launch the product here in um, early Q3 of this year. And so it will be available throughout uh, the US and Canada. Interesting, and I think this is gonna really help fire ground commanders, but we also need to remind fire ground commanders that this is to enhance your command, not take over your command. And if you're not applying basic ICS, um, you're already setting yourself up for failure. I just wanna give one uh, quick command failure because I see it not only in Connecticut, not only in the city, it's in the small towns, but throughout the country is that Fire ground commanders have a very difficult time on taking NIMS and applying it to the fire service. And uh, I'll have PJ weigh in on this and then the chief from Stanford. We can go around the horn. But one of the things that I commonly see is we see an incident commander establish command. And then we see a higher ranking chief come in and make that incident commander, that initial incident commander, operations. And then you have that chief, that's the IC, who now starts talking over operations. So once operations is declared, then that operational chief, whether they're a lieutenant captain, there's no rank in the incident command system, 
who's ever assigned that designation of operations, they are controlling everything that is in front of them and getting all the information that's coming back. The incident commander at that point is basically relegated to ensuring there's a transportation safety corridor to get ambulances in and out, um, water supply, anything behind uh, ensuring, talking to the press, ensuring the Red Cross is called, working with the liaison. They essentially take them out of the actual command of the incident. If you're a chief and you're listening to this and you come on scene and you want to still play as the incident commander, then don't declare operations, assign a division or a group and continue to command the operation. Don't diminish your own command. It seems that a lot of the junior officers understand basic incident command more than some of our senior chiefs across the country. And it actually diminishes the chief's authority, not enhances and puts that position in a position of esteem of where it belongs. Uh, Chief Norwood, can you weigh in on that? Yeah, Frank, I can. And, uh, you know, give some props to, you know, you, you uh, Chief Vendetto, and under the, uh, the guidance, I believe at the time was uh, Chief Mark Rally, uh, you know, being next door to New Haven uh, and listening to the, the scanner since the, the late 80s, I heard the change and saw the change in the command and control. And, and, and Frank, when you were in the school, um, I know that there was a very proactive attempt at changing that and changing the structure of your fire ground and really addressing the command and control. And the city of New Haven did a phenomenal job. We, we heard and saw that change um, of assigning groups and assigning divisions. And the IC was the IC and the operations was the IC. And the city of New Haven did a phenomenal job with that. And I, I, I know it wasn't easy. Um, you know, in East Haven, we tried to, to mirror what you were doing over time. Uh, but obviously it was much more challenging because we had less people. So it made it harder because we didn't have the individuals to sign to those groups and to those divisions. Um, but I think we're, we're, we're doing much better ac across the state. But of course, there's always room, room to advance. But you do make some very valid points on basically just staying in your lane. You have a task or an assignment. You stick to that task or your assignment and making sure that you're following the definition uh, as outlined in NIMS. And before I go to the chief of Stanford, I'll give a shout out to Chief Marcarelli, because when we instituted incident command in New Haven, there was a lot of growing pains. And one of the things that he did that really paid off is when he would assign, he would take command, he would sign a division, he would give them their radio designation. Their task was usually verbal because everybody understood the tactical objectives and tell them what companies assigned to that division officer. And so if he declared division two on a two and a half wood, uh, typical New England style structure for the second floor for fire operations, if a company called out to command on the radio before there was an, an emergency, he would very confidently and competently just correct the person over the radio. Command engine 15, you go through division two, division two talks to me. And, you know, it was initial shock for people in the beginning because no one wants to get called out on the radio. But I think that New Haven went leaps and bounds under him because once he did that a couple times, everybody got the message that when a division's called and you're part of that division, you go through that division and that division goes through command. So whenever an incident commander declares a division. So we know, as Anthony Avillo says, when you get other chief officers coming in in the school, you want to break up the opinion brigade. Because if you leave them at your command post, they're just critiquing your fire. So now we know we can decentralize the fire ground, increase our span of control, but now we can also assign them an accountability officer, a safety officer. You can give them this tablet so they can monitor air, they can do the par, so you can keep building out your command and building out divisions. Um, and it's been very successful, but even New Haven still needs a little bit of work on that. And one recommendation I give to division officers is we want to try to do as much face-to-face -face communications as possible because we want to cut down that radio traffic. And that's why I think this par button in this new system is so vital, but sometimes we don't put the right radio traffic out. So if you're the incident commander and you assign a division and you say your interior division and these are the companies that report to you, if you don't put that out on the radio, those companies don't know that. So if you're that division officer, say you're a captain in a smaller department, you get assigned interior division. If it's not announced over the radio, 
You need to announce that over the radio real quickly. Truck two captain is now division two. Engine two, truck one, rescue squad two is reporting directly to me. Say it over the radio. You don't need an acknowledgement. Then go in. And then when you get to your division, <coughs> make contact with the companies that you're actually supervising, kind of the hand contact. Hey, I'm here. What's going on? What's your report? And get everybody on the same page. Uh, Chief of Stanford, I, I might be mispronouncing your name. So is it is it Robles? It's Robles. Robles. I, I apologize. That's okay. So, so can you weigh in on some of those command things and how this technology will then aid when we're doing command the right way? So uh, I made some comments earlier in regards to the command and, and having senior officers come in and take over and how that happens. Uh, for us in, in Stanford, we have four deputy chiefs who are, they're all seasoned. They've been around for a while. And basically when any of the admin chiefs show up, we're, we're there to help them. Uh, it's rare that we'll take over command. Uh, we trust them. They're doing a great job. We're really their eyes and ears. Uh, we'll ask, first thing, we'll go right up to the command post. What do you need? And uh, in Stanford, we do have some areas that uh, do not have hydrants. And I've been to fires where they say, hey, uh, I need water. And, and, and that's what I'll do. I'll go make sure we, we set up our, our water supply tankers and uh, fill sites, drop sites, and, and we'll take care of the water. That way he doesn't have to be, worry about the water. All he's concerned about is putting this fire out. He has no ish, uh, no worries about how much water is coming or whatever. He knows the water is going to be there and he's going to be able to put this fire out. So it, it might be a little different in Stanford and it maybe not work everywhere else, but that's, that's the way we do it. Uh, it's rare that we'll take command. Uh, the admin chiefs will take command. We let the deputy chiefs handle that and we're there. We're extra eyes and ears and ask them what they need and we're there to help them. Any other resources, other alarms Do we have to hire back? Those are the things that will be working at as, as admin chiefs. Very good. Uh, Chief Vendetta, you want to weigh in? Yeah, I got just something I really want to weigh in on. So we're talking today, not just the ICS on the fire ground. So this whole project started a while back, even when I was working with different programs from Sims to Adashi or different accountability systems. And it was talking about let's merge together to help the fire ground. But we got to remember, and Frankie brought up a great point, it's about NIMS, it's about ICS. And the fire department in today's world does so much more than just fires. So you need your chief officer level to be comfortable at running ICS and NIMS and full blowing calls. We have to think about what's going on in our country nowadays. And unfortunately from Uvalde, um, and then you look at Connecticut being home, unfortunately of Sandy Hook, this is a small, small little idyllic Connecticut town. You would never imagine something like that can happen. But in these towns and in those incidents is when you truly need to be running full blowing ICS. So how do you share that information? How do you get that off the whiteboard? How do you make your chief officers and all the other responding agencies comfortable to use ICS and be able to get through those type calls is using it on your everyday calls. Now, the great advantage of taking uh, radios and taking Scott packs and taking ICS programs that can do that and merge it into one program where chief officers don't have to use three different programs to run. They're doing it with one and it actually helps them and guides them through the ICS process. Um, so I, when you, when you're looking at this computer program compared to drawing it on a board, you know, it's giving that leader. Uh, chief, I think you're hundred percent correct in, we're, the fire department is so much as bad as we are at it. The fire department is so much better than the police department. Any police chief will tell you that because we're more used to um, dealing with multiple resources. So it's critical, especially in an active shooter scene. You know, this isn't just for fire uh, fires. And we've used the dashi for bomb calls, suspicious packages, uh, active shooters working with the police. And it's important for the fire department to know is that it's almost your job as the fire department incident commander to get married with the incident commander of the police department. Because what we tends to happen is you get together, you start talking, you get that rapport. And then all of a sudden the police chief gets a phone call on his cell phone and he, they walk away from you. The the fire department needs to know that once you get married in command with that other agency, you, you need to stay together. And if they walk out right. of the post, you need to walk with them. Uh, Sanjay, you want to weigh in on all this? 
I do. I am uh, just a lowly firefighter in Rockville, so I can't talk about the command stuff, but I can tell you from a technology perspective, you, may, you talked about NIMS. Uh, you obviously support NIMS completely. Hold on, only- so, hold on, Sanjay. You lie, because firefighters always talk about the command staff. So <laughs> let's just let's just put that to st- – they have all the answers <laughs> until they're there. So but not to interrupt you, but go ahead. That's only at the dinner table. But uh, so we – we, we have the org structures built in, like we can customize this based on your operation. So Chief Fendero mentioned the, the incidents that are happening in the country or uh, currently. Based on call type from CAT, it's already pre-built for you. So we don't want the commanders to spend time thinking about what the structure looks like, what they need to use for an incident that they're facing. It is automatically pre-built based on incident type. All they do is start doing the assignments. And we also have checklists that can be automated and again, it's telling them what needs to be done because at two o'clock, and we don't want people to remember what all needs to happen if it's an active shooter. So we're telling them, here's all the different things you need to accomplish. You can customize it, of course, but it's more of a guideline to, for you to get started. Very well said. Kim, you want to weigh in on any of these other important aspects of this technology? Well, I, I just wanted to add that that was a main reason for the collaboration with uh, the software providers like Adashi is because our customers said they wanted way more information than what we were currently providing them with the uh, telemetry software that we um, currently offer so that they can have a complete picture, regardless of the incident, of what is happening um, at on, on one single piece of glass. So I thought that that was really, really um, um, important to, to stress is that, you know, whether it is a fire, you'll have, you know, that information or some other type of incident, everything that you need in one place um, is a major reason why we collaborated with Adashi on this. That is absolutely great. I want to weigh in on something that the chief says and put out another common command failure. Um, He made it clear that the administrative staff, when they come, they're the eyes and ears. Sometimes they won't take command and they'll help out. And I think that that is so critically important because it really gives a way to mentor your, um, your junior battalion chiefs, your junior command officers. And then if you can't fix it with a whisper, which usually you can, um, especially if you're competent, um, you could, if it was a rapidly escalating situation, you could take command from that person. But one of the things that we see as a trap that command officers and chiefs across the country fall into is they come there with the best intentions to be that mentor and they get to the command post. And instead of directing by whisper of mentoring that individual, they'll see something. And then that I got collar pins. I got to talk on the radio. Or as a company comes up, I got to give an order. And what happens is that battalion chief standing there, that higher ranking officer is actually diminishing their own command. And now you don't have one incident commander. Now you have two incident commanders. And it's such a level of frustration for younger chief officers. So one of the things that I started in New Haven to encourage was if a chief arrived on scene and they weren't going to take command and they were going to mentor to announce on the radio that they were on scene and announce that they were the senior advisor. And that means they can't talk on the radio. I see Chief Vendetto smiling. They can't talk on the radio. They can't give orders unless ordered by the incident commander. So to give you an example, you have three houses going, which is common in New Haven a couple times a year. The chief declares senior advisor, The battalion chief's doing a great job running the fire. The battalion chief's got another piece of tower apparatus coming in. He could look to that chief and say, chief, can you take care of placing that apparatus? Now, at that point in time, it's okay for the chief to give direct orders to that company coming in. But that's not what we see. Time and time again, we see the chief stands there and says, well, I can't stand here with my hand in my pockets and whisper. I got to present command presence. So I'm going to start ordering companies. That decreases firefighter safety. It also goes against this software and this technology where we're trying to bring command and control back to the fire ground. And I've, I've, I've worked with Adashi and I've seen that, you know, if it's followed and the chief's putting everything in and they got their scribe working, it can really make a big difference and really help the, the incident go. Um, PJ Norwood, can you weigh in on uh, senior advisor and 
not diminishing the lower chief's rank. If you're going to let them command the fire, let them command the fire. And then we'll go to the chief of Stanford. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Frank, I was always on the, the receiving end of that as a uh, battalion chief or a, a deputy chief. Um, and it was very, very challenging to continue commanding an incident when you have a, a chief doing his or her stuff off to the side, diminishing your role. Uh, but one thing that worked for me was I was a brand new battalion chief for my first fires I went to. The chief of the department came up that, at the time and he goes, uh, all right, I'm going to take command and I want you to do this. I go, chief, with all due respect, I think I have this. What I would like you to do is stand here on my hip and cover my blind spots and make sure I'm not missing anything. I said, teach me. This is my first big fire. I want to learn from you. And he was quite surprised that I asked for that, but didn't give him a role and wouldn't give up the command to him because I knew I had it under control, but I didn't want him stomping all over me in my incident. And I also wanted to set the tone for the rest of my career as, as a battalion chief. Um, and it worked very, very well. So to those junior officers out there or those you know junior command officers out there that may be struggling with that, I knew that was going to be a problem with me because I knew the chief of the department at that time and I watched him work with other battalion chiefs. So that was scripted. It was ready. It was one of those, almost those promotional questions that I had ready for that first fire. I saw him come down the street, go, here it is. And he came up, he said what he was going to say and I fired right back and it kind of really caught him off guard, but it worked. So if you're in that role and you're looking for something, try it, be prepared. You have that scripted response because the last thing you want to try to do when you're standing in front of that building is try to figure out what to say. That's not going to totally upset or piss him or her off. So have that, have that scripted line ready, ready of how you want that chief to augment help and mentor you, but not take over your incident. Chief of Stanford, because you, uh, the assistant chief of Stanford, you kind of started this ball rolling, but I think it's great information. Do you want to weigh in on that? Uh, I, Fred, I agree with you 100%. You know, we, from day one as a firefighter, you're taught, you have one boss, you listen to one boss. Once you get two bosses, you know, you're in trouble. Who, who are you going to listen to? So I agree. And I, and I think that's where the software helps too, because, you know, the incident commander is running it. Not only is it aware of, of what's happening, but he's going to get informed of the, the uh, air and the air packs and what's going on. And, you know, that's the person who should be running this. And that's the guy who should be given the orders, the guy who's running, who has the software, who, who is using the software and, and managing the people. So uh, somebody else who does like, like again, in, in our situation, we're walking around looking. Shame on me if I start barking orders from the back of the building. Right. Because I don't know what's happening in the front of the building. Uh, so usually what we'll do, we'll go to the front, meet with the incident commander and say, Hey, you know what? I, I see some flame in the back over here. Let's, let's, once you get a hose line to the back there. And, and that's how we do it in Stanford. Not that we're perfect, but I, I agree with you hundred percent. You, you got to stick with one boss. Yeah, absolutely. No fire department's uh, perfect. If you followed me around with a camera when I was on the job, it'd probably only take you about an hour to find me doing something dumb. So that's that's completely okay. The goal is that we can all do a little better. And this is where this partnership from Scott and Adashi comes in, is that we're, we're trying to do a little bit better, to, to make the incident commander's job a little bit easier, a little less stressful. This technology shouldn't add stress. It should take it away. And don't think that you can just put this into play and it's going to work perfect tomorrow. E even with the software and Scott having their end solid, you're still going to need all your incident commanders trained on it, like in your probie class, like Stanford did, you know, get it on the training ground, make sure you're getting the scribe, get all the kinks out so that your personnel, Sanjay talked a lot about that, you know, a lot of the newer incident commanders are a lot more friendly with the technology, but some of our older assaults that are still out there you know, need some time to get there, even if they're put into that scribe role. So make sure everybody's trained on it before you put it out. And sometimes that training will get somebody to cover a blind spot to say, hey, in our department, the way that we're set up, we need a policy that states this. And I think that that has merit. Sanjay, one of the things that I liked about Adashi and Chief Vendetto was big on it is that your software allows you to build also like a Mayday checklist so that the department can build it, not a pre-made checklist, but they can build their own mayday checklist that would come up that they can, you know, a checklist. Do we have a transportation corridor set up to get an ambulance in and out? Um, if we, what Lunar is, and 
while we're training firefighters across the country, very specifically to call the, the lunar, where commands failing across the country is not filling in the information if they don't get all the information on the lunar. So we're almost solving one component of the lunar with the air supply, but it's still about location, you know, needs, assignment, who, what their name is. We still want all of those components. And if the information isn't provided in that radio report, it's up to the incident commander to prompt, give guidance. And I always point people to a mayday in Boston. Um, the officer was perfectly calm. But if you listen to his radio transmissions, they were trapped in the basement and their line burned through and they kept saying their line burned through. And the guy was was calmer than I'm talking right now. And you could really feel for him. But you could tell it was almost like a and I don't want to say he was panicking, but it was almost like a quiet panic that he was just repeating himself. And then as soon as the dispatcher said, what's your location, you could see the tone in his voice change. His connected his mind and he immediately said over the radio, we're in the basement near the front of the building. Now, that's information we want at the front end. But in a mayday situation, you're not always going to get all that information and that stressful information. So if the chief's getting a mayday or giving a mayday and they're not getting all the lunar information, which is reasonable, they have to ask to fill out it. And even if the person can't give that message, they got to ask. So can you talk about how your software does that? Certainly. I mean, there's a lot of chaos when there's a mayday, right? First of all, if it doesn't happen, hopefully it doesn't happen enough. And if it does, they may not be completely trained on how to handle that. So the goal is to tell them, here's things you need to accomplish quickly. And the checklist is automatically populated with things that we have come up with based on feedback from different departments. But agencies can customize it completely based on their operational needs. But the goal is to tell them, here's things you need to accomplish if it's a mayday or whatever the incident type is, structure fire or, or a hazmat, whatever the case may be. But in terms of a mayday, as soon as the pass alarm goes off, like let's say the firefighter hits the pass, it automatically notifies the commander instantly as it happens. Then let's say I'm a safety officer assigned to a mayday, then I can switch to a mayday mode and start working my checklist and remind them of all the things that they need to do. And then, you know, if you need to do a PAR, you can start your PAR process immediately by hitting a button. So we make it very efficient. The goal here, like I think you mentioned that initially, is to first uh, find the firefighters quickly, and ultimately we want to save firefighter lives. Very well said. Uh, Chief Vendetto, you did a good job of building some of these checklists. So can you say, you know, was it easy to build a checklist and um, things of that nature? You're muted, Chief. Sorry about that. Yeah, the checklists are really easy to build, real simple to go along, get them in there, um, have them to be followed. Remember, too, with the program, if, if you're the RIC company, um, think about everybody just keeping everybody on the same page, knowing where guys are. If you're responding into the call, you could be coming into a call. Like, so small towns, right? Mutual aid is now coming in for RIC. This is some information that the on the engine, on tablets, that could actually go out to those tablets where they're already seeing the org chart and already starting to see where companies are assigned. So they're already known engine one's on the second floor, engine three is on the sec, you know, first floor basement. So they're already becoming situationally aware as they're coming in. RID officers can stay on top of it right from the beginning of where everybody is assigned and who's working where. So the checklist, yeah, absolutely to help you for any type of call. We had them in there for uh, high angle rescue, uh, water rescues. We had them in there for bomb threats, hazmats. All the steps were in there to make sure that, you know, um, the aides or the scribes or people doing it can actually turn it on, go down the list and make sure they were hitting what they had to get covered. Why the incident commander was running the call, they can just simply say, hey, we still need to get this done. And like to what PJ Norwood was saying, in our PSAP center, they actually had access to all that also too, to be able to see that and get that information shared. I think the best part about today, what needs to be said is ICS is a reality. We all need to do it, no matter the size of your department. How do we make it better? How do we make it sim simpler? How do we turn around and bring all these different technologies that are coming out together to work ultimately in the goal of the safety of the firefighter? It's number one goal going on scene as an incident commander is the safety of your crew. So to make sure you got that information and take care of your crew, is, is the most important thing. And what's the most efficient way? 
Um, so it has to be out there. Very well said, Chief. Um, I'm going to go around the horn because we're at the witching hour of this uh, great hangout. And uh, I think we could do this for several hours. Uh, <laughs> Chief of Stanford, do you want to weigh in on uh, on this technology and your experience with it? And uh, what? A, let's put it this way. I like putting people on the spot. If one of our listeners is interested in this technology, can they call and talk to you offline about it? Is that something that you're willing to? To do, we always like to try to give our listeners some some real feedback because we don't want to talk to Sanji and Scott and the salespeople. We want to talk to real firefighters. I, I actually would recommend that uh, because I am excited about the software. I, I think it's it's a game changer uh, I, I, in many ways. Uh, cutting the air with the pars and uh, again, I said being you know having incident awareness. This is incident. You're going to be informed. If you have the manpower, you're going to know exactly how much air your firefighters have. And you're going to make the moves as an incident commander beforehand, before that bell, the, the alert goes off that, hey, he's running out of air. You're going to make the decision. He's close to running out of air. Let me get him out of there. Let's get the next crew in. So I, I think it's going to be a, a huge advantage to be using this software. And actually, in the future, I'm hoping that we get body temperature and other things going back to the incident commander. So he has more information and he's able to make better decisions on the fire ground. And again, I strongly believe that this will save lives in the future. Terrific. Um, Kim from Scott, uh, last word of the day, uh, fill us in. Yeah, so Frank, thank you for having us um, uh, on this conversation. And I also wanna send a special thanks to uh, Stanford and New Haven for helping us with, you know, perfect, you know, making this um, software better, making, uh, t letting us know what we need to do in order to make uh, the software work for them. So I, I really appreciate it. And thank you again for having me. Um, it's been an honor to have you on. And uh, I, I don't know the chief's name in Stanford off uh, the top of my head, the chief of department, let's at least mention his name and chief Alston in New Haven for having the vision to put this R and D uh, forward with, uh, past chief uh, Vendetto. Um, who's the chief of Stanford now? Chief Trevor Roach. Okay. So we, we appreciate that. Sanjay, last word. End of the day, Frank, we want to save lives. We hope our partnership will just do just that. Oh, short and sweet, like the constitution. We, the people, I love it. <laughs> I love it. Um, BJ Norwood, director. Um, go ahead. Kudos to the Stanford Fire Department for not being stuck in old ways and looking to provide a better avenue to better serve their community, as well as their firefighters, as well as the city of New Haven, who's uh, re represented by some retirees here, but no current staff of the department. Um, I always like to see incorporating technology into training and also our fire grounds when it's going to enhance our safety, enhance our operational uh, ability. So kudos to both those departments. All right, that's it for today's Fire Engineering uh, Hangout. We, it was an honor to have these guests. I'm really hoping that the Assistant Chief of Stanford will write an article about this R&D and maybe include in Chief Vendetto, put something together. We'd love to be able to publish something online, but it's great when we have fire departments assisting in R&D. I think the science and getting different departments together is so critical to firefighter safety. Um, I remember I used to work for DuPont and consulting. We brought in Yale University for some studies and we were doing science before it was cool, PJ. Um, we did uh, for last chance, we brought in departments for all around the country for uh, filter, New York City, LA, Detroit. And it's amazing what we can all learn from each other. And the ironic thing is sometimes we do better job nationally networking than networking with our own states. And that's one thing that Director of Training, PJ Norwood's been doing a great job of, is getting departments to talk to each other and really move our state forward. So um, it's an honor to have everybody here, especially Sanjay, fellow Rockville member. Um, and uh, on behalf of Bobby Hall and Fire Engineering, and of course, I got to thank uh, Peter, who's been doing the back end of this uh, call today. We appreciate all his hard work. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in to um, Fire Engineering Hangout. Please put this on your Facebook, Twitter, social media, send it out, get the word out, and uh, hopefully everybody will be putting in for a class at FDIC. Take care.